Uh, so a brief introduction to myself. I'm Stephen Pierce. I drive uh, our um, business development activities with our global medical device clients. And so as Joe mentioned, I have been spending quite a bit of time recently in Asia. So to our Japanese participant, America Yokoso. Um, that's, uh, I know a little bit of Japanese. So welcome to America. And uh, hopefully uh, um, together we'll gain some insights into the future of wearable tech in healthcare. Um, speaking of which, how many of us are involved in the wearable tech space? By raise of hands. OK, a, a few of us. Um, and uh, as you've seen from uh, recent trade shows like CES, wearable tech and healthcare applications of wearable tech were a key theme of major trade shows. Um, however, if you think about wearable technology in healthcare, it's been around for quite a bit of time. Uh, and. Uh, if I can get this thing to work, here we go. Uh, wearable tech, you know, at CES, a lot of the discussion was around fitness bands, Jawbone, uh, up um, Nike, uh, Fuel Band, Fitbit, etc. And I must admit, complete disclosure, I am not just a uh, participant in this space; I'm actually a user. Uh, I have a Basis uh, device, which, uh, which is fantastic, as well as a Garmin Vivo Fit. I have the Misfit. I have the Fitbit. I have the, uh, I have the, uh, the Jawbone up as well. So I've used many of these devices. Um, and as you can see by my posture, I fit well within John's definition of a homo geekus. Uh, I try to avoid the you know, fast fooderous. Um, subspecies, but based upon an extreme travel schedule and also high stress levels <laughs> with a job, I will be a future user of many of your implantable devices, I'm sure, as well. Hopefully not a hackable pacemaker. Um, but uh, to that end, uh, you know, IBM is doing quite a bit of work with medical device companies in the uh, uh, in the healthcare space, um, and we're also engaged heavily with healthcare providers and payers um, as well in defining how wearable technology can be leveraged to drive what we call smarter care. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that, about uh, um, you know areas where we view medical opportunities to to be uh, for wearable technology, as well as some of the challenges and opportunities in realizing that future. So uh, just a little bit of a perspective uh, on IBM. Um, when you think of healthcare, you probably don't think of uh, IBM uh, as one of the you know, key companies. But uh, we are actually ha have quite a bit of involvement in the healthcare space. Um, we have a number of professionals um, and uh, clinicians who are part of our global healthcare team. We also have a self-pay model. So we are involved in setting policies related to the care of our employees. Um, uh, and we are investing uh, significantly in uh, healthcare uh, technologies, as uh, I believe uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Marty Cohn explained a little bit about yesterday. Um, you know, Watson and healthcare would be one example of some of the investments that are being made, and not just in the healthcare space, but in adjacent spaces. Um, we have an, uh, an initiative. Um, around the Internet of Things and around taking data from not just medical devices, but from other devices that can be connected to the Internet uh, around the, in the patient's environment, whether they be a, a television, a camera, um, an air conditioning unit, um, energy-based uh, devices, et cetera, to get a more holistic view of the patient, not just their clinical vitals, but also their activity levels, dietary levels, social components as well, um, because those are key to realizing this vision of smarter care, which is heavily focused not just on acute care, um, but also on early intervention and even you know, preventative care. So as I mentioned before, wearable med tech isn't new. Um, as was mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, you know, you've had uh, implantable uh, pacemakers, for example, I think the first one was developed in the 1950s by Siemens, I believe. Um, so you have, and that's a, a, an image of that first implantable uh, pacemaker. Uh, you've had, of course, uh, vital monitoring suits um, used in military applications since the 40s and 50s. So wearable tech has been around a while. So what's new? Why the hype? Well, 
a lot of it is around what, we, what I call the three I's, we call in, in, in IBM the smarter planet three I's, interconnection, insights, and integration. Really taking the data from discrete devices, aggregating it, not just along a single data silo, but across multiple data sources. Now that would include multiple wearable devices, uh, diagnostic imaging, the EMR, et cetera, to provide a more complete picture of the patient um, and then using that to drive analytics, to, uh, to drive insights on what is the patient's condition, how does that patient's condition compare to tens or hundreds of thousands of other patients to identify similar cohorts or cohorts of patients with similar conditions, uh, and then to use that to drive a coordinated care plan. Um, that spans organizational walls, that extends beyond the hospital to home care, transitional care, um, et cetera. So those are some of the recent changes um, where wearable tech ha has a significant opportunity. Um, of course, there are challenges uh, to this. Um, if you look at the fitness market, you know, it's already being commoditized. Most of the technologies uh, from these types of devices are based upon accelerometer-based technology. So, you know, my colleagues would like to joke, if I'm short on my steps at the end of the day, I just wave my arm a few times and I achieve my goal. <laughs> Whereas, you know, for, for example, the Garmin VivoFit, I have a, a heart rate monitor that actually tracks heart rate patterns. The basis also as well has a, a wrist-based heart rate monitor. So we're starting to move into a direction of having more um, data of clinical value, but still, it, it's a long, long road. And the current devices, don't necessarily have the clinical value, nor, uh, and they're being commoditized uh, quickly. Um, as you've seen from the uh, recent announcement from Nike and their discontinuation of the fuel band, um, you know, there, there are questions as to whether a device itself can really capture financial value for the technology provider. Um, so definitely issues around device commoditization and the business model. So selling devices in and of themselves won't necessarily be a road to success. Also, just providing a smartphone app or getting a, or providing a silo of data or analytics associated with that data silo would not necessarily be of significant value to the patient or the provider as well. So, you know, even this Garmin VivoFit has a great um, smartphone app. It tracks, you know, sleep patterns as well as, um, you know, activity levels, but it doesn't necessarily help me to improve my health. So I think those are some of the challenges that we're seeing in our discussions with um, wearable tech uh, clients. This is probably a, 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 a so what slide here. Um, I think we all agree that chronic disease management is the primary opportunity that we see in as far as driving healthcare transformation. You know, as you look at the uh, majority of spend on healthcare, not just in the US, but even um, in emerging markets that are developing developed economy types of diseases, like India, that has tremendous growth in, in um, um, cardiac disease. The focus on reducing costs by taking action earlier in the process, um, during the earlier intervention stage, or even the healthy stage, is critical. I'm a great example of that genetic predisposition towards heart disease, um, not very good activity levels, you know, 200,000 plus miles of travel, business related travel each year. So my uh, cardiologist should be telling me I need to take certain actions and wearable devices will enable me to monitor my patterns and potentially drive benefits if done correctly um, or drive positive action on my part. As you see from some of the quotes on the bottom, you know, but they, this isn't just um, kind of pie in the sky type of discussions, but there are you know, significant uh, growth potential um, in these markets on the order of you know, uh, estimated $20 billion in the next uh, couple of years uh, and significant value from a healthcare cost reduction standpoint. You know, McKinsey is estimating 10 to 20% reduction in or savings in chronic disease management, which you know, could be huge um, from an overall societal perspective. So how do we take action and where are the, the market opportunities in the space? We feel strongly remote patient monitoring, not just focusing on um, inpatient monitoring, but outpatient monitoring is, is the huge opportunity. Um, interestingly enough, when we talk with most traditional medical device companies whose customer sets are the provider 
or the, you know, the hospital CIO or CMIO, they still think within that uh, traditional customer set. So they're, they want to do interesting things when it comes to wearable technology, but it's still having the traditional customer um, and maybe providing consultative services on discharge procedures, for example, for a, you know, a, a CHF patient, and how to optimize that to reduce patient readmissions. You know, it definitely has a potential benefit around, you know, a benefit to ACOs around the reduction of 30-day uh, patient readmits. Um, but I think they're focusing a little bit on this narrow slice and on the short term, but forgetting this long-term opportunity. I think, as you mentioned, I, I didn't catch your name, but uh, Medtronic is trying to transition from just a technology provider to a, a uh, heart disease management uh, company. So they're trying to own the disease. Even th they are st still siloed because as you consider that most patients with heart disease have multiple comorbidities, then how do they extend beyond just uh, heart disease into um, other diseases? And I think Medtronic of all the companies is probably the best position because they also have diabetes and other associated diseases. So they have the potential to grow. And they are investing in acquisitions such as Cardiocom to really it, it transition from a discrete product or technology provider into a solutions company. So I think they're making strides. That's one thing that I would suggest and I, uh, to you as you look at the wearable tech spaces, you know, going from just providing an interesting, very interesting technology to providing a disease management solution. But I'll get into that more of that later. Um, there's also an issue around um, uh, or implications to product development. Um, and sales as you transition outside of the acute care environment. Uh, uh, many of my clients love investing in high-end, high-quality, very expensive um, technologies, um, diagnostic and therapeutic technologies that are focused on the acute care environment. But as you move into areas like residential care, assisted living, nursing homes, and even home care, price becomes a critical issue. And so being able to balance between investment in superior hardware technology and good enough hardware technology with the primary value being provided in software and services um, becomes more of a, a balance that a COO and VP of R&D needs to consider. So you know, we're talking with companies around doing data analytics uh, in the cloud environment and then of course you know, providing the data back to the provider or to the patient um, in a mobile type of format. So telehealth is you know, a key example of this transition between the hardware, software, services balance in a solution. Uh, this also applies to the emerging market. Um, as you look at China and India, the ability of emerging market providers um, and payers to pay for these high-end solutions um, is much more constrained. So being able to provide a lower cost solution or lower capex solution with some type of subscription model that enables you to capture value, but is more of an operating expense or aligns their revenue and their costs uh, becomes a, a much more important play. Um, I think one kind of morbid example of some of the issues in um, emerging markets is that there is a established recyclable market for implantable devices um, in um, emerging markets. So you may see an internal cardioverter defibrillator that is actually um, recycled post-mortem um, and used in emerging markets. You know, still because it's so high quality, it can be recycled and recertified, um, but the price point would be such that an emerging market can afford them. So uh, wearables, of course, will enable a transition from more of a traditional uh, uh, care delivery process to a process that is more integrated, where you'll have data that's being captured um, in the hospital, integrated with an overall care plan, that telehealth and telemedicine type of uh, offerings would also integrate those sources of data uh, with the care plan, um, and that there will be advanced analytics, cognitive analytics, which will support the provider, whether it be the specialist, um, the primary care provider, the care coordinator, et cetera, to get additional insights into what, what the patient is dealing with, um, and then dynamically modify the care plan based upon those insights. So and you'll see a number of devices that go from 
um, cardiac rhythm monitoring devices to you know, cell phone based devices that uh, Dr. Topol has used before when he you know, diagnosed a patient suffering from a heart arrhythmia on a plane via a live core you know, basic case that connects to a, a cell phone. Um, to the pancreum, you know, artificial pancreas that monitors glucose levels and can act as an insulin pump on a kind of one integrated device. So a number of interesting uh, technologies that are being developed. I think the one in the middle, we talked about Google Glass. Well, we're going one level further. You know, you have, Google is investing in contact lens technology. Um, you know, there are other companies that are also investing in this kind of technology to drive not just presentation of patient data, but also therapeutic value and diagnostic value to assess, you know, the um, do retinal scans of patients to uh, identify, uh, you know, predisposition towards uh, diabetic or diabetes, or even, you know, identify uh, a diabetic retinopathy. So there are very interesting technologies that are being applied, not just in, you know, the traditional wrist space, but across the body. So the opportunities to med tech companies are that you can get outside of the traditional market of dealing with the cardiologist, um, the um, you know, I imaging specialist, uh, the emergency room physician, et cetera, into new spaces, into the home, um, into accountable care organizations, and again, into uh, early chronic um, uh, and uh, healthy or, or wellness type of solutions. That said, there are also challenges. There are new competitors that are coming up. When I go to Asia, almost every company that I talk to in the electronics industry, not just in the med device space, whether they be in consumer electronics, industrial automation, um, network, networking, um, telcos, et cetera, all want to talk about healthcare. They see it as a great opportunity, and they are providing or coming at it from a unique perspective. Their primary relationships aren't necessarily with clinicians, but they have an understanding in consumer usage patterns. And so ease of use or developing something that has a high you know, tendency to be used is something that they tend to be a little bit better at than traditional medical device companies. Also, they may have an additional presence in the home. They can embed a camera in their flat panel display that can then monitor a geriatric patient as they go about their daily routine. It, they can also provide rehabilitative services through that camera where they can uh, do image recognition to identify is a patient doing their exercise appropriately and then integrate that back into the care plan to say, okay, they did do, the, do their daily exercise. If they didn't, send a message to their son or daughter saying, hey, you may want to go check on them or give them a call to encourage them to take action or to do their exercise. So they have a unique perspective in the healthcare ecosystem, which I think we can learn from. And also, there's the opportunity to partner together with them. So um, based upon our insight and experience um, and discussions with uh, a number of players in the healthcare ecosystem, we have this vision we call smarter care. Um, uh, part of our overall Smarter Planet and Internet of Things initiative. And that's really to drive uh, healthcare transformation at three levels. The first of which, of course, is the connected, connectivity level. Gather data not just from a single medical device, but from multiple medical devices. Gather environmental data. Um, gather um, activity type of data. Gather um, data from a smarter refrigerator on you know, dietary um, consumption, gather information from retailers, retailer loyalty programs to say, what is this? You know, is uh, Stephen purchasing Lucky Charms, or you know, um, is he purchasing lettuce and vegetables? So, uh, gathering that type of information. The challenge, of course, is integrating that data and having a consistent 360-degree view of the patient. Um, also, even just within the medical device space developing what we call a longitudinal patient record, um, which is being able to filter the terabytes of data and to provide insights to the clinician and the provider at the right, and, and the patient at the right time, that is meaningful. Um, you know, we've had discussions around image analytics with, um, with a number of uh, radiologists, and the typical radiologists will not look at most of the data related to an angiography because there are just so many you know, images. Um, 
a, what is it, about 30%, 30 to 40% of clinicians, you know, you ha take significant or make significant use of an EMR. Um, so it, relatively low adoption patterns, even though EMRs are out there, the usage, effective usage of EMR is still limited because there's just so much data and a clinician does not have the time to get meaningful insights from that data. So being able to filter the data, put it through a sieve as it were, and, and then drive analytics based upon that. Um, and uh, Marty talked, uh, I believe, a little bit about Watson, you know, applying cognitive capabilities to provide advisory support um, to the clinician to say, you know, what, what are the potential um, issues with the patient and what is the source data associated with those so that the clinician can make effective decisions. Again, Watson isn't a doctor, it's not making the decisions <laughs> for the clinician, but it's an advisor that will provide the clinician a few options and help them to be more efficient. Um, and then of course, tying that to a care plan. Um, being able to coordinate care based upon the patient's condition is absolutely essential. Um, and it's not just within the clinical environment, but it's in the social environment, it's within the community. Um, it's factoring in lifestyle issues and relationships that the, the patient has. So. Those are the key components of what we call smarter care. And you can you know, see some examples. Um, at the top, there's a you know, new kind of design um, that will be particularly applicable in the Chinese market where I think you're going to have over 100 million um, COPD patients uh, over the next uh, couple of years, primarily based upon environmental factors. So an example of smarter care would be to understand the patient's predisposition towards certain types of pollutants in the air um, based upon um, clinical data, um, being able to, based upon environmental data, predict the presence of certain pollutants uh, in the skies over Shenzhen, um, and then being able to integrate that with suggestions back to the patient or the provider to take action, to wear a mask, or to not go outside, and then potentially link that back to employers to say, these employees will not be able to come into work. You need to adjust your plans or your capacity or your recent staffing based upon these particular issues. You know, particularly relevant in China. Has, has anybody spent much time in China? Yeah, so you probably know the air quality is just, you know, crazy. Um, exactly, exactly. And I'm going to Shenzhen, which is, I think, almost as, yeah, yeah, almost as bad as, uh, as uh, Beijing in uh, two weeks. And uh, yeah, so these types of solutions will have not just individual benefits, but tremendous societal benefits, um, you know, and, and economic benefits to businesses. So wearable devices, where do these fit? As you can see, if you're talking just about a diagnostic technology, it's kind of just a piece of the picture. The real value comes from the data, from the insights, and from the coordination. So, of course, wearable devices can also fit in the user interface, assuming that you're going beyond just, you know, providing something in a, you know, iPhone or iPad type of uh, uh, um, interface, um, you know, or Google Glass or the Google contact lens, et cetera. But the key thing that um, companies investing in the wearable tech space is how do they solve those middle pieces? You know, do you invest in developing that capability yourself? You know, potentially. Or you can also partner with other companies or acquire new uh, companies that may have capabilities in those spaces. Typically, the way that IBM goes to market is we partner. We don't manufacture medical devices, so we may provide some of those middle pieces and engage with an ecosystem of data sources. Uh, and then also the owners of the data. IBM doesn't own uh, patient data, of course, so we'll partner with providers, with payers, um, it's a, and, and with communities to capture that type of data and we'll provide some services and, and, or technologies to them to enable that. So these are some of the components of IBM's uh, Smarter Care. As I talked about, you know, it's really the foundational components. That blue piece is around remote patient monitoring. That's where wearables can fit. Um, and then it's integrating that into a longitudinal patient record, uh, using some analytics to first filter out the data um, to focus only on the data that's relevant to the patient's condition to um, drive analytics both at an individual level, at a population level, um, and then to use that to drive personalized care to the patient. Um, and 
IBM is investing in these kind of capabilities, but, oh, oh I think I'm talking too much. I'm not very far in my presentation, so, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, we're, we're not just, you know, providing a complete solution around this, but again, we, we partner together with companies to do this. Um, Watson is one example. We have something called the Watson Developer Cloud, which allows some of our strategic partners to access Watson, the Watson tool, and do analytics using data that they provide, and even build API or um, applications on top of that platform. And Blue Mix is another more recent announcement um, around developing a, uh, providing a cloud platform and development environment that can, can enable companies to develop new applications, leveraging the infrastructure that's that's there. So there are different opportunities as we look at uh, um, partnering as a as I look at uh, some of our clients in an area where I've been spending quite a bit of time, Asia, and many of them are interested in investing in dis neat new technologies. One CTO uh, recently told me, I want to be like Olympus, who has, you know, what, 70, 80% market share of the endoscopy, diagnostic endoscopy market. He said, I want to invest in, develop that new sustainable technology, but this other piece around, what, you know, what happens with the data? I don't know what to do with that, so let's talk about you know, how we can you know, build those pieces together. Also, if any of you are interested in uh, um, providing or selling your technology to uh, companies, every Asian company that I talk to is, you know, has an active acquisition <laughs> uh, strategy around developing or acquiring new um, healthcare technologies. So I'd be happy to talk with you more about that. Um, so uh, Watson is just one example. I think uh, Marty already talked about in, uh, this. So uh, unless you have questions, I'll kind of skip over this piece uh, for the sake of time. But uh, just to let you know, Watson is in our pilots, um, is being used not just in a kind of uh, analytics uh, or a diagnostic support role, uh, but also in training in you know, uh, identifying or evaluating different care protocols for, you know, um, chemotherapy protocols, for example. So there are a number of different applications of cognitive type of capability. And so, as you can see, IBM is investing quite a bit in this space. What do we see our clients doing? Some of them, as they look at um, this transformation in healthcare, are sticking to their knitting and are saying, we have great technology, and we may use connectivity, um, and we may use um, a, 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 these analytics pieces to enhance our own products, but still within a very narrow, narrow band. So um, even though uh, we're told that uh, healthcare or medical device companies are not supposed to capture de-identified data, uh, I don't know of many who are not. <laughs> Um, but they're using that to enhance their products, to say, okay, what features are being used? How can we improve the diagnostic value of our particular product? So it's uh, tightly involved in the R&D and PLM process. Um, but uh, there are other companies that are saying, okay, we have, we recognize that the value is not in the technology necessarily. Well, there's value in the technology, but there's an increasing value in the data. Right now we have terabytes of data that are just sitting around. Let's do something meaningful with that to provide, for example, population analytics, to provide consulting services back to providers on how they, again, discharge patients, you know, and, you know, instruct them to look for these um, pre-symptoms towards, you know, uh, readmission. Uh, so they're looking to expand their services, still the primary data source is their products. And then there are other companies, you know, Medtronic, for example, who is looking to uh, expand into disease management solutions, you know, and you could even see potentially, and I've actually talked with an entrepreneur um, around uh, a uh, very low-end endoscopy device um, that is based upon off-the-shelf components that plugs into a PC very, via USB port um, that is targeted at clinicians in Africa. I'm not sure if you saw CNBC uh, yesterday, but our CEO, Ginny Rometty, was, was on, conducted an interview, and one of the things she said was, Africa offers tremendous growth in the future. And this would just be one example of that. Um, a clinician or a general practice practitioner in um, Tanzania may not have specific experience around um, OBGYN procedures or oncology, but you know, due to capacity issues, he may have to play that role. So this company is looking to 
not provide kind of good enough hardware technology, but provide educational and training services via the cloud. So they'll provide instruction to say, okay, for this type of procedure, here's what you do. Um, and then capture the data and via teleimaging services or teleradiology services, provide some feedback to say, here's some warning areas you need to look for. So that's an example of a very low cost hardware technology solution, high value to the particular practitioner um, that is, uh, is uh, using this equipment. By the way, that's a subscription model. Because the device is relatively low cost, they rent it for a few hundred dollars a month. Uh, there, are, there are ultrasound devices as well that are being used in a similar fashion. So as we look at the, the approach to uh, wear, wearable medical solutions, these are just you know, some of the key findings, and I'd love to talk about this uh, more with you. Of course, it's important to have clinical assets or, or defined clinical value to the technologies that you develop. What we're talking about is not just providing generic technologies, but really focusing on specific disease states like you know, diabetes, uh, um, oncology, uh, cardiology, et cetera, um, and specifically around helping to manage the disease before it ever becomes acute. Um, radical simplification of the user experience is absolutely essential. Um, you know, something, even something like this, uh, which is relatively simple, and for homo geekus like me, I forget to press the button that puts it into sleep mode so with, or sleep monitoring mode. So something that is just, and if you look at many of the telehealth pilots, many of them require the patients to step on a scale, look at the information, you know, insert it, or, you know, or actually have them set up the Bluetooth or Wi-Fi wi connectivity between their Wyvings, you know, um, scale and their PC. Um, and then, you know, that transmits the information to a provider and then how the provider gets that and integrates that, that's still, you know, um, a relatively manual process. So radical simplification and also partnerships to drive integration of that data. So you have a more complete picture of the patient and then also you're providing more value to, the, to your customer. Um, again, the leverage analytics uh, for uh, extreme personalization. Um, driving insight at the point of care. So, you know, as I use these devices, for example, again, they're not clinical devices, but providing feedback to me when I can take action is critical or to the provider. You know, Dr. Topol likes to say that in the future there'll be a heart attack app that will tell you, okay, in the next 30 days you're gonna have a heart attack. <laughs> Which I, I think it is, is great, but even that, to say within 30 days you, you, know, you may have a heart attack, it's you need to take action now because you're suffering an arrhythmia and you need to either take medication or sit down or, you know, or automatically call um, a, uh, an ambulance to, to take care of you. So that's a kind of integration and extreme personalization that we're talking about. And insight at the point of care. Um, partnering is absolutely essential. Focus on value, as, as I'm sure you, you, you well know. Looking to new customer sets. Um, looking at emerging markets is a great opportunity because they're willing to invest. They may not have the balkanization of governance that is evident in the U.S. Uh, and so there are great opportunities in the Middle East. I think uh, the uh, Singapore Ministry of Health, for example, is running a study around telehealth for aging in place patients so that they don't have to visit their doctor but you know, can get information on their um, state of health and then, you know, um, appropriate action taken uh, if necessary. Um, and then also you ha could have new customers even in developed markets. Walgreens, CVS, Walmart, they are investing in healthcare services and they're still trying to figure it out but to the degree that you can provide new technologies or new insights to them, that opens up a huge new customer segment for you. Um, around, for example, um, you know, um, remote triage, uh, a, a geriatric patients tend to visit Walgreens, you know, quite a bit. Um, so going in and having a device that will capture data from a wearable, um, a wearable device, uh, have enable the patient to scan their insurance card, maybe do some diagnostics right there, whether it be a, a quick blood test or a, a scan of their retina, which would suggest, you know, different types of disease states or predisposition towards diseases. Uh, and then 
integration back with the nurse behind the uh, pharmacy counter, or even to the nearest urgent care facility to say, this patient needs to, you know, needs to come and visit, scheduling an appointment uh, for that patient. Those are the types of opportunities as you look at wearable technology that will expand beyond just your traditional customer segment. And then, of course, to do all of this, the traditional um, product development process that is very hardware focused of investing for years in technology, um, going through clinical trials, and then bringing that to, or doing pilots with providers, uh, and then you know, bringing it to a uh, market, that's going to change a bit where you're gonna need solutions delivery capability and sales capability, partnering capability, together with a multitude of different um, types of partners will be absolutely essential. So those are just some of the things that we're discussing with our clients, both medical device, medical equipment, life sciences, and healthcare payers and providers. So that's just a quick overview of uh, where we see the wearable tech market going in healthcare and some of the activities that we're doing. Are there any questions? Joe, did I come in in time? Okay, great, great. Yes. Here we go. Not for the video. Okay. Uh, in the video game industry, we, I'm seeing an interesting trend where uh, rather than highly centralized games, we have, uh, there, there's a real market for games which are, uh, and games devices and physical things, which are really just person, single person centric. In other words, they can operate them without a high degree of interoperability with a larger system. Do you see a lot of that, especially with application uh, to the Middle East and remote areas with medical devices? Um, I'm not sure if I fully understood your question, so please correct me if, if I'm going off on a tangent. Uh, gamification, the social aspect of care? Oh, not that, absolutely... just the individualization. In other mm -hmm. words, you would sell somebody a, right. a, an instrument of therapy right. which would not require being linked in with, uh, you know, with a central control network. Um, I think certainly there's the opportunity to do that. Um, the discussions we've had with many of our clients are around trying to drive or use large sets of data, big data, to really drive personalization. So at some point there would need to be some linkage, but is that a persistent linkage? Not necessarily. So you could say, okay, let's do some population level analytics and then drive that to the particular patient's care at a single point, or it could be on a continuous or persistent basis. But one other comment that I didn't mention is socialization, gamification of healthcare is uh, absolutely essential. As you can see you know, from these devices, these devices aren't necessarily having the desired effect. Um, one reason is- We don't know how big you were last week, though. <laughs> I gained 30 pounds over the last year, um, primarily due to IBM's hectic travel schedule. But you know, if this uh, data were being pro provided to my wife uh, or to my friends, and if we were conducting a game on who can you know, lose the most weight, then the effectiveness or efficacy of the particular solution would be you know, heightened. I have a question. Um, who is going to pay for all this? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, there's just terabytes of data, I understand, that could be generated every hour um, per person. Yeah. And ultimately, wouldn't it be great if all this went to our health record and the telemedicine provider called you and told you you're running low, have a mm -hmm. shot of orange juice and all this stuff? But mm -hmm. there are so many players between I'm wearing my Fitbit and I got a call from my telemedicine provider, who, by the way, is not compensating my physician, who's not so on board with telemed. How, who, what are you finding? What are the right. obstacles to IBM closing business as a result of this? Right. Well, uh, well, one of the reasons that many med device companies are focused on transitional care is because, to a certain degree, there is a defined business model and customer. ACOs will look to use remote patient monitoring in a transitional care environment to avoid the cost of readmission. So that's one example, but in the larger sense around chronic disease management, that is a question. That said, there are cities that are starting to develop private partnerships around population level health to drive certain initiatives around wellness um, and 
um, prevention of uh, chronic disease. Uh, you'll see in Europe, for example, ministries of health that are investing in these initiatives as well. And then also on the other side, um, capitating services that providers can provide. So, um, you know, one example that I'm involved in is outside of the wearable space, but diagnostic imaging, imaging centers uh, in uh, the UK, for example, have a certain capacity level, um, and they are not supposed to exceed that. So radiologists are starting to be consulted as part of the process for determining whether or not a certain imaging study needs to occur. So there are, I think, both carrot and stick um, components um, out there in the market. In the US market, it's, I think, much more challenging, and that's why one of the things that we discuss with our clients is to identify a potential emerging market where some of these use cases can be evaluated and developed, and you have a, a more streamlined governance structure when it comes to investing in these types of initiatives. Okay. I have another question, but let me defer to the crowd if you have something. So you talked about what medical device companies are doing in terms of um, providing some sort of solutions to help yeah. hospitals manage their patients a little bit better. Um, given that there's so many new entrants in this space, Apple, Google, what is the real danger for device companies to ignore the consumer? I would say in the near term, in the US, um, there is limited risk. You know, the providers and the payers still make the decisions and are defining the reimbursement model. Um, in the future, however, yeah, are you familiar with uh, Clay Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma? Yes. Um, you know, so, so an old uh, uh, professor of mine, uh, great guy, by the way, um, he wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma, also a, a book around um, how his model is, is applies to healthcare. But he was basically saying that there are, tech, there are companies that invest in great technologies and are a high degree of innovation, but then they get stuck on that innovation. And then there are companies on the low end that start to come from an adjacent space or another space, and then you know, slowly build their presence using their capabilities. And that the, um, the high innovation companies will say, well, we don't want that low end. That's low margin product. So we'll just invest in this high quality you know, space. Uh, because we have defined differentiation there. And what happens is they increasingly become a niche player in the market. So you'll see this in the consumer electronics space quite a bit. Um, but in the medical device space, that's happening as well. Um, in the imaging space, you know, GE, Siemens, Philips had, you know, continued to dominate the market, but a comp Chinese company called Mindray in Shenzhen um, has, you know, basically developed a strong position in the Chinese market and is now competing with them effectively in the developed markets as well. So using good enough technology and then growing that space. So consumer electronics companies, for example, or you know, other players, they don't have the assets and the technologies and the insights and the relationships that you have, but that's something that they can start to acquire. Um, and then also, as you, know, you see this, you know, somewhat delayed trend towards patient-centered, uh, centric uh, healthcare, that their presence and their understanding of the patient will play a greater role. And so, um, I think that'll be important to watch over the next few years. For me, it's easy to imagine, you know, 50 years from now, surely everyone will, and then go down the list of everything that will have worked itself out. Mm -hmm. In the nearer term, however, you know, with, with a lot of devices entering the marketplace and who's going to pay for it and adoption and doctor acceptance and the like. In your view and perhaps IBM's view, what do you think will be the catalyst, the, the thing that is firmly rooted now given that the device or given that the information or given that doctors have now come to accept, what do you think is going to be the thing that pivots and has you know, okay, now this is obvious. We absolutely have to get on board with this. Yeah. Now, there, there are, continue to be a lot of obstacles, uh, whether it be, you know, um, defined value of some of the data that's coming from 
um, from uh, wearable devices. You know, what's the clinical value? What's the meaningful use? Um, what are the issues around uh, security and data and uh, patient privacy, uh, et cetera? I would say the inflection point um, is as you look at, and I focus more on emerging markets, the growth in, for example, India around chronic, uh, around uh, diabetes and congestive heart failure, there is just a fundamental uh, train wreck happening where the capacity, the available number of beds per patient or per capita will demand that something be done, that care be extended into the home and they use technology to drive this. So I could see that the emerging markets will really drive this transition, the inflection point will be this issue between supply and demand. We'll take our last question. Hi, uh, Neha Sagal with the Healthcare Technology Incubator in El Paso called Red Sky. Uh, why haven't the superpowers that be IBM, Google, um, HP's up there as well, um, Microsoft, come together hmm. and come up with a one-stop shop solution instead of separate um, different different initiatives. I mean, I'm seeing even yeah. even the mobile companies, AT and T, Verizon, things like that. Yeah. Um, why hasn't this? Is it happening, or is it going to happen? Um, yeah, uh, th th there are always uh, attempts to do some of that. Uh, you know, a number of tech companies are involved in a uh, wearable and connected device uh, healthcare interface called Continuum. Um, IBM has contributed a, a certain transmission protocol, made it open source as part of that. So I think there are a number of initiatives that are going on, but um, to be honest, technology providers and even medical device manufacturers can't drive this. We're like the tail wagging the dog. It's the providers, uh, particularly you know, um, uh, provider, payer providers like Kaiser that are really in the strongest position in the near term to drive this um, change. and as you see, you know, this confluence in the ecosystem around recognizing the need to change, um, then I think that's when it will happen. So, you know, we're active participants in it. We're trying to drive um, transformation, but um, even a number of high, you know, Google, IBM, Microsoft, Apple, well, we can't do it alone. You know, it's it's really the the clinicians. Um, and the payers um, and the patients that will drive this change.